Welcome. Welcome to Battle Chess, the first fully animated computer chess game. This is the tutorial, and I am the king. The land you see around me is my kingdom and my battlefield. Two opposing forces meet on this battleground, but only one can be the winner. Only one can be the true king. In early Indian warfare, battles were decided by the death or capture of the king, and this principle was transferred to the chessboard when the game was invented in the early 7th century. As king, I am the most important of all chessmen. In fact, I am the only indispensable man in the game of chess. But it's not easy being king. In times of war, I have to manage the defense of my realm without playing too active a role that would expose me to danger. My safety is of the utmost importance. Without me, my kingdom is nothing, and all my subjects would be out of a job. In the beginning of the game, I usually play a defensive role. But in the end game, I am more likely to use my considerable striking power to defend my realm when necessary. Except when I am castling, which the rook will explain later. I can only move one square at a time in one direction. In medieval times, it was said that the king's move and power of capture are in all directions because the king's will is law. However, a king doesn't get to be my age by doing stupid things. So I never move directly into a clear line of attack from an enemy piece. Such a movement would put me in check, which is an immediate and direct threat to my existence. Now, whenever an enemy piece is rude enough to put me in check, I must immediately take care of the situation. I can move out of check in one of three ways. By putting one of my loyal defenders in position to block the attack, by moving to a safe square, or by capturing the enemy piece that threatens me. At the end of most chess games, a situation occurs which is known as checkmate. Checkmate is an attack upon a king from which there is no possible escape. While a check is merely a threat to a king, a checkmate is the pronouncement of his certain doom. For example, this is a checkmate situation. This is the sort of situation that really makes me nervous. I'm lucky this isn't a real game. Sometimes the two opposing chess kingdoms can become so exhausted from their tactical and strategic maneuvers that neither one can annihilate the other.
In that case, nobody wins and nobody loses. So the game ends in a draw. This is frustrating for everyone, but it doesn't happen often. It may interest you to know that two kings can stand on a chessboard in 3,612 legal positions. However, even though I am powerful, it's not safe for a king to stand around by himself. One final note about the movement of a king, which hasn't changed much in 12 centuries, is that he can capture a queen, but he can never get close enough to threaten her. However, the queen can constantly threaten and harass the king. Nag, nag, nag all the time. She never lets me get any peace. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have to go pass a few laws and tax a few peasants. To introduce myself, I am His Excellency, the Bishop. I'm a powerful figure in modern-day chess, but I was not always a bishop. At various times in chess history, I have been known as the Sage, the Old Man, the Fool, the Count, the Spy, and the Thief. When the game started in India, my ancestor was an elephant. Bishops were unknown in those days, but elephant squadrons were essential elements in the army of old India. In medieval chess, the elephant chess piece became a court jester. A bit later, in the days of Catholic Europe, the ecclesiastical bishop became an important advisor to the royal family. So, he appeared on the chessboard. I am the king's bishop, because I stand beside him and advise him at the beginning of each chess game. But the queen also has a bishop, who stands beside her in the beginning. The two bishops work together throughout the game, and we each have our own territory. One bishop stays on the light-colored squares of the chessboard, while the other stays on the dark-colored squares. In this way, the action of one bishop never duplicates, obstructs, or interferes with the movements of the other bishop. Since bishops have a higher power on their side, they can move diagonally in any direction over as many empty squares as desired. If an enemy is in my path, I may capture the enemy and take the enemy's place on the board. It works like this. Ha 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 ha!
So, um, we bishops have the advantage of controlling all the unoccupied squares in our immediate diagonal paths across the board. However, the disadvantage of a bishop is his inability to control the squares of an opposite color. This weakness becomes apparent when one of the two bishops has been captured, but we try not to let that happen. Excuse me, but I seem to have a lot of visitors today. Perhaps this lowly pawn wishes to surrender himself to me. Surrender my eye? comes from a Western Arabic word that means chariot. The chariot was one of the four divisions of the Indian Army. The others were the infantry, the cavalry, and the elephants. I have also been called the castle, the tower, the rector, the marquis, and the boat. But if you call me anything else but a rook, I'll smash you! I am second only to the Queen in terms of my power of movement. I move parallel to the sides of the chessboard, across any number of unoccupied squares in any file or rank. I can move forward, backward, or sideways, but not diagonally. If an enemy is in my path, I can smash him and take his place. At the beginning of a game, I can't do much because everyone is in my way. I hate that! I want to smash things! I'm best at controlling long, open lines of squares. I am most powerful when I work as a team with my brother Rook, who starts the game at the opposite end of the board from me. If I start on the Queen's side, I am the Queen's Rook, and my brother would be the King's Rook. Now pay attention, because I'm going to demonstrate castling and I'm only going to go through it once. If you don't understand, I'll smash you! The ancient Italians viewed the Rook as a fortress into which the King could flee for safety when he was threatened. This point of view evolved into the modern system of castling, which can only occur once per player, per game. It's the only time a player can move two pieces during a single turn and the only time a king can move more than one square per turn. This is a castling maneuver.
This move usually provides more safety for his majesty, and puts me in a better position to bust some heads. Castling can only occur if the king and the castling rook have not previously been moved during the game, and if the king is not in check. Obviously, the squares between the king and the rook must be unoccupied. In this situation, castling could not occur, because the king would have to move through check to reach his destination. But his majesty can still castle in the other direction. Castling occurs in about 95% of all chess games, and in 90% of these games, the players castle with the king's rook because there are fewer pieces to move out of the way. And that's all there is to it. It should now be obvious to you that a rook laughs at danger. I scare the pants off most of the chess pieces. Entire armies break like crashing waves against me, leaving me unharmed. I fear nothing. Well, almost nothing. You see that? I broke a fingernail! Sorry. The king kept me awake with his snoring all last night, so I'm kind of in a bad mood. Anyway, I'm the queen. I'm the real power behind the throne, and in front of the throne in this game. I don't just stare at myself in the mirror all day like those wimpy queens you read about in fairy tales. I'm a warrior queen. I go out and do all the real work while the king sits around the castle passing laws and taxing peasants. I can fight any other piece in this game and beat the stuffing out of him despite what that egomaniac rook may have told you. In the early versions of chess, there was no queen on the chessboard. <laughs> Obviously, this was a major mistake. Once I was introduced to the game, I gradually took on more power until about 1490, when I developed the ability to move in all directions as the most powerful piece on the board. I can move in a straight line, in any direction, over as many unoccupied squares as I desire. If anyone dares to get in my way, I blast them out of their shoes and take their place on the board. So, I essentially have the combined movement power of a rook and a bishop. I'm the most effective when I have plenty of room to work in since I can control so much territory at once. Now you might think it would be a good idea to get me out on the board early in the game and use me for almost everything. But it's not a good idea to rely too heavily on any one piece, since combinations of pieces are required for a good game. Besides, I'm also a big target when I'm out walking around alone without any protection. And you don't want to lose me if you can avoid it. One other thing I'll tell you about before I go is pawn promotion, 
which is sometimes known as queening. If you manage to get one or more of your pawns all the way across the board to the eighth rank, that pawn is transformed into a more powerful piece, which is usually a queen. If you get eight pawns across the board, you could have eight new queens plus your original queen, although that would be pretty unusual. The original idea was that the infantry private who survived all the hazards of the battlefield had earned a promotion to an officer's rank. <laughs> of course, becoming a queen also means a sex change for the unsuspecting pawn, which may come as something of a surprise. And if I'm still on the board, the king would then have two or more queens, which is fine for the king. But it really ticks me off! Now, my headache is killing me, so I'm leaving. <laughs> ah, that's better. I am the knight, and I have a question for you. Have you ever heard of hippophobia? It sounds like a fear of hippos, doesn't it? Actually, it's applied to chess players who fear the presence of enemy knights on the chessboard. These players take great risks for the sole purpose of getting those enemy knights off the board. Hippos comes from the Greek word meaning horse. In many countries, the knight is still known as the horse, and many chess sets represent the knight with a piece shaped like a horse. My unusual L-shaped movement is intended to symbolize the action of mounted troops on the battlefield. I attack the enemy as they pass, rather than in front, and leap over obstacles in a bound, unable to stop in mid-leap. From my starting position, I move two squares along the same rank or file, and then one square to the right or left. I can make this move regardless of any pieces that may be in my way, friendly or hostile as long as my destination is not occupied by a friendly piece. Enemy pieces are taken like this. A unique advantage I have is my ability to attack any other piece without placing myself in immediate danger from that piece. Once I make an attack, no one can stand in my way. No other chess piece can say that. I'm also the only chess piece that can move before any of the pawns have moved at the opening of the game. I leap over them like they aren't even there. You'll find that I am most valuable in cramped positions and when there are a lot of other pieces on the board. I'm not one of those wimpy pieces like the bishop who prefer to work at long range. I like to get in close, 
where I can see and smell my enemy and make him nervous with my presence. At various times, I have been referred to as the clown of the chessboard, the terror of the chessboard, the jumper, the boogaboo of the beginner, and the practical joker. Now, I believe this lowly pawn would like to say a few words. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> lowly pawn. The way I see it, we're all pawns in the game of life. Someone is always pushing us around. <laughs> always telling us what to do and deciding our fates. Then we can't fight it. I don't care who you are. A king, a queen, a bishop, or a pawn. We all come to the same fate in the end. We're all doomed. It's just that a pawn reaches that fate faster than the other pieces on the board. Pawns are just cannon fodder. It's so depressing. Consider this. These are the functions of the eight pawns to shield the king by controlling the third and fourth ranks with our bodies, to defend and be the first to be sacrificed, to engage the enemy in combat, to prepare the way for more important chess pieces, and if we're really lucky, to struggle forward to the eighth rank for a battlefield promotion. As you can see, these pawn functions aren't exactly conducive to a long life. Have you noticed you never see a gray-haired old pawn? <laughs> now you know why. The word pawn is derived from peon, which means laborer. In 15th century England, the eight pawns were carved to represent different trades. The rook's pawns represented farm workers. The knight's pawns represented stone, iron, or woodworkers, or keepers of the king's highway. The bishop's pawns were notaries and innkeepers. The king's pawns were merchant bankers. The queen's pawns were physicians. Those were the days when we had better lives. Then, in the 18th century, all pawns were made to look identical, and we lost our individuality. Now it's more like being in the army. Let's talk about my movement. Either because we're brave, or because we're stupid, pawns can only move forward into unoccupied squares, one square at a time. We never retreat, so a bad pawn move can't be corrected. However, the first time a pawn is moved, he has the option of moving forward two squares. When I take an enemy piece, they have to be waiting for me in one of the two squares diagonally ahead of me. I can't take a piece that's directly in my forward path. This is supposed to resemble a soldier slaying his enemy with a sideward thrust of his sword. Baby, let's see if you can take me. Uh, what about your husband, the king? He's not here. Forget about him. I want you. This is some kind of trick, isn't it? You're my sworn enemy, Your Majesty. You never know unless you take a chance and come on over here. It's your move. Whoa! 
I'll show you a royal good time. <sighs> yeah. I knew it was a trick. Anyway, the pawn's motto is, United we stand, divided we fall. Pretty clever, huh? I just made it up. But the biggest pawn weakness shows up when a pawn gets isolated from its fellow pawns. Isolated pawns are easy prey for enemy attacks. However, you'll notice that more powerful pieces usually retreat when faced with a pawn attack. A queen is as strong as eight pawns, but she will normally retreat when attacked by one. One more thing I should tell you about is how I take an enemy piece en passant, which is a French term that means in passing. When I'm in a square at the fifth rank, like I am now, and an enemy pawn decides to move forward two squares on his first move, I can capture him en passant, like this. Well, there are times when you won't want to make an unpassant capture, so this is an optional maneuver. In any case, it's too dangerous for me to keep standing around out here by myself, so I'll just be moving along, if you don't mind. There's a lot more you need to learn about chess than we can possibly tell you about here, but you should know enough now to get started. And what's my advice? Avoid losing, and that way you'll always win. Play chess now, or I'll smash you! <laughs>